This is Fantology. You may have heard of us. All right, what's up, poets, scholars, and Benjamin Buttons out there? This is Stephen, your host with Anthology Podcast. I have my lifelong friends, Ryan, Jake, and Ben here. We're talking about Hyperion by Dan Simmons, chapters three and four. We've gone through the first two chapters in the past few weeks, and we're doing a combo for this one. This is the poet and scholar's tale. And if you remember back, we originally started this when Jake challenged Ben to read the book, and uh, Jake is our de facto expert, not expert, but just like bigger fan of the series. Ben and I are reading for the first time, and, and Ryan read a little bit ago. So here we are all together with some big brain moments as we review these chapters. Cool. So, I mean, the last one we reviewed was the uh, the soldier's tale. <clears throat> I feel like that one was pretty confusing um, all around. Agreed in the uh, the confusion aspect. How did you guys? Mm -hmm. uh, how did you feel uh, this one or these uh, tales did in terms of uh, uh, progressing the story, uh, mm -hmm. making things more complicated, less complicated? I think <clears throat> what. Even though the warrior one might have been confusing, it made up for it in action. But yeah. The poet's one, it didn't even really have that going for it. But by but it had all that wit. Was there wit? Uh, okay. <laughs> I but liked I liked the poet's tale. I will say scholar's tale has been probably my favorite so far. Maybe maybe not maybe the priest one was a little bit better, but scholar's tale is great. Um that's just my high level overview for it. Yeah, the scholar's, scholar's tale, tale, my favorite so far. It was gripping. Like the whole time I was so interested. It's the one that has like I feel like impacted me, like I think back to the most on uh on like, the series of Hyperion. The Scholar's Tale should have a Black Mirror episode based on it. Yeah. Mm. I would watch the heck out of that episode. Yeah. And yeah. I, I've kind of like hinted at this a little bit and I'm not going to get into spoilers, obviously, but the way like just the way book two uh, continues, uh, like diving into some of the character stories. I don't know. It's just so good. So good. But that's a long ways off from where we are now. <laughs> We're getting close. We're like two thirds of the way through the book. Yeah. Yeah. Four to, four to six stories. Yeah. And uh, to your point, Ryan, I, I really like the poet's tale. Um, it was probably my least favorite the first time I read it. Um, I, I really disliked Martin Salinas uh, the first time I read the book. Um, but he's definitely grown on me. Um, yeah. Well, you can, I mean, dislike him as a character and still like his story, right? You can, but I think a lot of why I disliked the story is because I, I disliked the character and it's so much of that character's mind and head mm -hmm. and like uh uh sense of self importance that uh the first time yeah. around I, I didn't like it, but I do feel like the other stories have, you know, more like personal meaning behind all of them more I I think greater significance to me almost whereas the the poet is just he's like trying to find his muse almost and that's the shrike but i don't know it he he really isn't that great of a guy right he's, he's basically letting people die to the shrike so that he can keep writing his story that's that's how he sees it yeah yeah i mean so okay, wait, Stephen. Did you you gave your kind of overall thoughts, right? Because I I, I want to make sure that we like before we jump start jumping into like uh, just to put a fast. bow on yeah to put a bow on my thoughts. Loved chapter four, the the scholar's tale, and the poet's tale was just like a big nothing for me. <laughs> I didn't care for the character at all, and the story was pretty boring. And I do not really see. Uh, nearly as much like a point to it as the other ones. So you guys are gonna have to convince me. Why. Well, I don't think we're gonna. I mean, 
I think me well, and Ryan I, are not going to try and convince you that much. Ryan said he Ryan said he liked it, so I, oh, that's I'm true. you yeah. know open mind. But my opinion going in is I did not care for this chapter. So can I say why I didn't like it? I you may I, okay. Thank you, Ryan. I thought that there was just the one character had so many different characters, right? Like he started off as like kind of a wealthy person on planet Earth, had like a weird relationship with his mom. And then, like, he he got, like, booted down to, like, the slums of the Earth, or not slums of the Earth, but slums of the galaxy, I guess, where he, like, could only say, like, swear words, and he, like, didn't have anything going for him, but he, like, found some happiness in that, and he, that, that to me, is a gripping character, and the fact that by the end of that, by the end of the story, he seemingly, like, completely forgot his, like, that experience and was just sacrificing to people to the strike is kind of unbelievable for me. I don't know. That's kind of why I had a hard time with it. I'm like, is this even the same person that I'm reading about right so now? So was it because of his, you know, regression back to a, a bad or, you know, selfishness that you disliked it? See, I don't even know if it was a regression because I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a bit, but I don't think that we really got told that he was a bad person on planet earth, maybe like a little spoiled, but it wasn't, she wasn't, I don't think that he's regressing to that person necessarily. I think that he, maybe you can say he's regressing to when he was just so, uh, he, he had so much fame going for him and then that kind of got stripped away and maybe he's regressing towards that, but I don't know. It just, I feel like why have the plot line where he was just beat down to nothing if that doesn't impact his character at all, like going forward? That's my that's my thought. Yeah, I, I think my pushback on it would be I I see I feel like he's a pretty consistent character who grows throughout his time. He he lived like multiple lives. I think he did live, you know, multiple lives through like all of his experiences he had but he seemed like the same character in my mind, just like progressing through that. Um, my takeaway on the importance of, well, like his overall goal ha- was always to write, like to be a great poet, to like write true poetry and be a true artist in that way and creator. But was, um, that, was that his goal though? <clears throat> I mean, was that his goal when he like became uh, like, mentally handicapped or whatever i thought i thought he just kind of that was that so that was his his goal uh when he was like a child like on earth on old earth and then he had the the misfortune of uh becoming uh like having the the brain injury or like whatever from he was sent to flee earth because old earth was dying right yeah and then he was put in like the yeah the old cryogenic sleep that had you know bad his, side effects yeah because he was stuck there for too long for longer than it was intended um mm. and it was during it was during that time on like the where he was basically a slave that i feel like that's where he like discovered like it was him like trudging to the bottoms of humanity in order to like capture like kind of understand like like the high he went from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows to capture that full human experience and also it was like his poetry that uh that like saved him out of that. So in my mind, like his goal for like writing the perfect, like creating the perfect poem or you know, the cantos, I think that was still a driving force throughout every phase of his life, um, including that. And it mm. was like instrumental to bringing him out of it, as well as in my mind, giving him the experience, the necessary experience to write it. That but he didn't even confusion. write about that experience or, either. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. I said he didn't even write about that experience. He re- like wasn't the cantos about old earth. Yeah, it was like the history of old of old earth, but it's not that it's it, not it that like informed him enough to write it or something. Like, yeah, it, yeah, like it gave him uh he he was like this spoiled child, you know, he went from having everything to having nothing and in my mind having that breadth of experience is what helped him like know how to write about humanity and so it's kind of like if batman chose to become a poet instead of a vigilante 
I don't think Batman goes from like top of society to bottom of society. <laughs> That's he true. goes from top of society to beating the crap out of the bottom of society. <laughs> That's true. I see what you're trying to go for there. Ryan, you you and I read the Sunny Dirt book. I as I was reading this, it felt like his opening, like the the parts of his plot that we've talked about so far were very similar to uh what's his name, the main character in that are you are you seeing that? Uh yeah, I can definitely see what you mean did you, there. Jake, did you or Ben read? I read the book? first oh. one. I read the okay. first one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's really. a little bit there. That just kind of came to mind. Anyway, you were asking about confusion, Jake. I think I'm a little confused on what the actual muse is. Like we're led to believe, or at least he believes that the strike is connected to this. But when he first writes his contos, I don't see that connection with the strike. He's just yeah. on this world beaten down. Like, what is this? I guess the strike was involved later. We kind of see that a little bit, but initially i'm confused there i felt it was the subject matter of his most recent book that he was attempting to write that more i thought i thought it kind of drew the strike out but jake's jake had an interesting comment where it was like that's that's what martin silenus thinks well i mean there's lots of things like up in the air right like and you'd have to just based off of everyone else's experiences with the Shrike, you know, like they've all had personal experiences with the Shrike. That's his personal experience with the Shrike, which was very different than mm. Assad's personal experience. Um, um, and and Saul's and uh, uh, Dure. Um, to dance to clear up that confusion, Stephen, from my understanding, it's been a while since I, I, I read this again, but. I don't, yeah, I don't think the Shrike was involved until he started to try to write the Hyperion Cantos, which is, mm. in his mind, his magnum opus. Um, whereas the other thing was like a great work of art in his mind, but it wasn't, it wasn't to the same degree. And so his muse for writing his greatest work is the Shrike. And that, those are interconnected with uh, when he was able to like write, start writing, and when the Shrike appears and things like that mm -hmm. whereas the other one i i don't remember it being connected at all to the shrike it was just him recapturing his uh okay okay his humanity and his ability to create art yeah um and i think that that like drive to create create the perfect uh piece of art though is like his unifying characteristic throughout and that's what's driving him towards the end when he's like with the shrike is like he gets to the point where he's like he's pretty sure like that him continuing to write is killing people because it's summoning the shrike and that there's like that kind of recursive relationship where he needs the mm -hmm. shrike in order to write and him writing causes the shrike to come and uh and like his but his drive to create that beautiful like perfect piece of art is so strong that he's willing to sacrifice so much other well, he's not sacrificing things. He's willing to let other people suffer for it. And mm -hmm. not up until he sees his like best friend die, does he decide to stop. But then we're right back to where, you know, he's like, he's going, why is he going back to Hyperion? You know? Right. Right. So. Hmm. I will say, I thought that this story provided some explanation as far as the history of the world or the universe and some of the technology and his house with the different rooms that were all connected to different worlds. Yeah. yeah. Like this, that was all cool, really imaginative kind of cool stuff. And it provided some explanation because before reading this, we didn't really understand how those things work. We, it's still a little, you know, hand wavy. It's not like hard sci-fi, um, but those were some pros of the story. I'll, I'll give it that. Yeah. It it helped it helped us understand what's going on. Yeah, I think if apart from like Martin's character and his story, you get a better sense of the history of the the series, like going back to old earth and seeing the first colonization effort of uh or maybe not the first, but like the the most recent colonization yeah, effort of Hyperion ships, yeah. Yeah. Um and uh and then I, I think even the first time I read it, 
the part I really liked was the end when when like the Shrike comes and like the confrontation between him and Good King or Sad King Billy and like tossing the like burning the manuscript and then the Shrike comes and you see him like in the flames and I thought that was like really well done mm. even when I didn't uh, didn't enjoy it the first time around that I feel like again that's Dan Simmons leaning into his horror uh, expertise. Yeah, Sad King Billy was such a sympathetic, sad, cautionary tale. I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I really enjoyed that character. Yeah. Can I just say that, you know, I love the way that each of these characters is written. It just feels like each character has a different voice. And also, I love the narration, the, the audiobook yeah. narration of this book. So both of those have made um, the experience really good. And I do just, I do think that although I did like the poet's tale when thinking about the scholar, the soldier, and now this, um, uh, who am I missing? The poet, the scholar, the, 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 the soldier, priest. the priest, priest um, that the poet's tale is kind of the weakest one of, of the bunch. Yeah. I, I think another thing uh, that is like a pro Anacon is I feel like clearly Martin is like a self insert for Dan Simmons. Um, mm. And I can't tell, I, I like to believe he's being tongue in cheek with himself. Like this is how arrogant writers and like poets are. But sometimes I'm like, or is, is this really him drinking his own Kool-Aid? You know, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> like, how much of this is like uh like making fun of himself versus like no this is what he really thinks of himself but there was definitely some i don't know if i'd say self insert but some uh like real world application with the uh, the books that he was writing and being told to you know produce this like just this crappy pulpy stuff yeah. over and over again would make money yeah. and he's like a uh, tired of, like that obviously sounded like a like an author experience. Yeah. And that's kind of like his his arc has been like, I want to create like true art, but then I, I have these setbacks, whether it's like mental, physical, financial, or you know, political basically. Um have you read or, any of his other books outside of the Hyperion books? No, I, I really want to read The Terror, and I just I, I don't know why I've never have, but we should do it jake okay yeah. yeah i'm totally down um i feel like there's one more thing i was going to say about his tale um i don't know and i guess the but, last thing for me is just kind of this uncertainty as to what is his actual relationship with the strike is he really summoning as a solely yeah. responsible it seems like an entity that is more powerful than this one dude writing a book of poetry. So I, oh, I just yeah. wonder, you know, what exactly is that? And I think that's, that's not answered in like in a good way, I, you know, it leaves that mystery open for the rest of the book, maybe future books. Yeah. That's, think, that's what, Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think it's also hard to know what the strikes motivation is like, why, there's like no clues as to why he's visiting these people. Like, are these people just like famous enough or I don't know, pivotal enough yeah. or have like enough of a connection to Hyperion? Like what's, you know, I feel like there needs to be some, some more breadcrumbs. Maybe I'm just missing all of them. And maybe Jake, you're just like, I wish I could point out to you all the times that um, all the times that I, all the things I'm missing, but yeah, that's where, that's where I'm at. No, that's pretty intentional to make it uh, very mysterious. Um, I think on a on a reread, you can definitely pick up on on some stuff. But on a first time read, I I don't think you're intended to really pick up on um, mm. most of it. Um, Sometimes was... that's kind of nice as a reader, you know, just to be in total mystery, like the suspense of like the motivation. Why is it doing? You're like trying desperately to connect it and you can't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's very much meant to be a mystery. And so uh, don't feel bad if, if it is confusing. Well, the thing is a mystery 
for me, a mystery is something that like is giving you clues that like a classic murder okay. mystery. Yeah, yeah. It's it's is, not supposed you know to be I mean? it's not a mystery novel and that you're supposed to piece together. It's meant to be mysterious and okay. and unknown. It's like the Shrike is more like this eldritch horror, like Lovecraftian type thing where it's un understandable. Like you're it's not you're not able to fathom what it is. It's so un like inhuman in that way. Um so, that's fair. Yeah. Um what I was gonna say about uh the last thing with Martin is so he's trying to write the Hyperion Contos, which is basically a re like he's like lifting the name and similar themes from a real life poem that I I think it's John Keats attempted to write but never finished and like was this famously unfinished piece of work of John Keats. And and so there's supposed to be some parallels there between um Martin trying to finish his cantos um and like hype the planet was named after the poem by john Keats, the unfinished poem by john keats yeah. mm. anyways okay and john keats is an actual poet part right yeah pardon yeah. my my yeah. Uh, lack of knowledge from old earth from old earth yeah <clears throat> okay let's go on to the scholar's tale that's yeah. the one that really i think we want to talk about the most yeah. This one was interesting where there wasn't a ton of plot. I mean, it, the, the stories are not super long, but there's a lot to think about, even with the few things that happened. It felt long to me. Right, because it was so engaging. But if you mm -hmm. actually like write out the plot points that happened, it was basically Rachel goes to the time tombs, contracts the sickness. They try to deal with it in a bunch of ways. They get the dream. His wife dies. And then they go back I, yeah i, I mean level. most of it is in his head right him like wrestling with the yeah the abraham like uh, conundrum but yeah this one is... i was gonna say this one is like a bit navel gazy compared to the rest of them i think my main criticism for this is actually wraps a bunch of the stories together and why i'm confused it's confusing to me why these people don't know each other or at least have heard of each other, why they have to have these stories explained to them. Because if you look at the poet and the scholar, they would have heard about these things, right? Maybe it's just like such a vast galaxy, but like this is like a number one selling author and somebody that has like this once in a, like once ever medical conundrum like how would they not have known about each other why are these people mysterious to each other and well, so that was the main question i had going through this one i mean i guess just in response to martin C silenus didn't his book his first book sell so well but it turns out that everybody bought it really just to put it on it's like a coffee table book almost you know just yeah. his decoration but still you still, know, you still know his name because he he then like went on to be super active in politics i mean it would be like I don't know. It would be like not knowing who like Dan Brown is or something. Like at least one person on the you ship would think is gonna that, know that person. Uh, that Saul Weintraub especially would know because he did all this research and I appear on and like he would have come across anyone else who is connected to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I so think, I don't yeah. know. That's my that's well, that's one of my questions, such criticisms with, with this. Them not knowing Martin, I, I feel like might would be harder to justify. I think the rest like like Rachel's sickness is not something that would like, they probably wouldn't want it like in the tabloids, you know, and like, well, it wasn't the tabloids though. That's the problem. Yeah. It was made it, it really big. Yeah. yeah. Was it really big? I don't they, remember. They had, like, like eventually and stuff. Eventually he went on like the equivalent of good morning America mm -hmm. with her and tried oh, to, that's right. Tried yeah. to drum up to get support the yeah. from the church of the shrike. Right. To get mm -hmm. the, the pilgrimage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't Yeah. Maybe it is just the, uh, it's so vast. The, vast, the vastness, but yeah, those two. Yeah, I think that's a good, uh, good call out. These two, especially like the other stories. Yeah, like, like a war, had, like a general or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Oh, and people I had heard of the general. Yeah, guy. they had heard of him. Yeah. But, um, but and I, I want to push back on the navel gazy. I don't think this. I don't think it's a navel gazy story. It's like. I feel self reflection. Like it, Maybe, yeah, maybe I don't really know what navel gazy means. I interpret navel gazy as uh like in your feelings. 
rather oh, than I, I, a, a negative was... negative connotation for sure. Yeah, I think self indulgent is... or excessive contemplation of oneself. And whereas this one was more like a philosophical uh like deconstruction. I don't know. And maybe maybe that's just uh for some someone like me who's into that type of stuff in sci-fi, it's not navel gazy, but for people who aren't, it is. So mm. maybe it is just a, a matter of taste there. But I um, I mean I, I love that. I, 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 I also enjoyed that. it. I was I more said this, that in response to like the plot points. Like there wasn't that many plot points, but I still yeah. found it engaging. It was just most of the interesting dialogue happened in his own head. Like, yeah thinking about the situation you know what i mean yeah this was the story like this story was why i wanted you to to read hyperion honestly um and uh so i'm glad we're finally here and i'm glad that you you did enjoy it i'm glad you enjoyed it too steven because i feel like you were more like just you know along for the ride so <laughs> i i just i remember it, it was so devastating <laughs> when i really like when i connected the fact yeah. that like oh this is why he has a baby on board and like yeah like that just it hit me so yeah. hard it was like oh man yeah and i can't i think i re it was it took me like a bit like longer than it should have to like realize oh this is rachel you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. also a bit of a miss him not naming rachel rebecca for like because that's isaac's wife in the bible i felt like if you're gonna choose an r name you gotta pay some some homage I mean, well, Rachel's I mean, also Rachel's, Rachel's Jacob's wife. Oh, Rachel. Too. Yeah, but why? Why are you Jacob's wife? I guess. I don't know. Sorry, that's that's an aside. I don't know. <laughs> Trying to remember my Old Testament prophets. Abraham the doesn't have a daughter, exactly. so. Um, uh, but yeah, so I'm glad you guys liked it. I something before we get into like the, like deep parts of it. Something I think that Dan Simmons does so well in this book is having each story have its own theme and its own, like, like complete, it feels like a completely separate story than the, the, like the book as a whole while yeah, still, yeah. While still having really good connections back to the overall world building. Like you, the, t all the time tomb stuff is like really relevant to the overall plot of like, I mean, they're basically heading there right now, you know? And so it has like this, almost completely separate story with this one puzzle piece that like connects it back into the main narrative in a really uh, natural way. Um, but other than that, it's like a completely different style of story. And I think he just nails that, but it's almost like an anthology, which is what Dan Simmons wrote in the terror and maybe in other books mm. of his, I, I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Mm. The um, aspect that I really liked and connected with was like him wrestling with this great injustice that had been done and then coming to coming to like God in this way of trying to figure out how this all works together. And, you know, kind of some of these basic questions of like, how could this be possible that this is, you know, that I've got to deal with this, that, that my daughter's going through this, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then also this aspect of the dream where he's got a being told to sacrifice her. How, how could this possibly make sense? Anyway, I, it, it just feels, I feel like this is a fairly central human experience of something bad has happened and how could the cosmos allow this? And yeah. it was written really well in a way that probably like anyone can connect with. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I don't I can't remember Dan Simmons personal uh, beliefs, but I think he does a really good job exploring like the the spectrum of devotion to God to complete atheism. Um, well, like I really like that wrestling, like you said, like especially when uh, Saul is is trying to like figure out how to justify a request to sacrifice your child. Like, and, and like you just have these different pieces of that, uh, that like philosophical question of if, like, if God is all good and all knowing, you know, but also this is such a terrible thing to ask of somebody, like, in what, 
in what like situation does this turn out to be the best case thing to do, mm-hmm. like something necessary to do. And I, I loved how he goes through like different phases of, you know, probing and testing different uh, rationale for it. Um, and uh, I can't, I don't want to spoil anything. Where, where does he land uh, at the end of this story? Or is he still wrestling? He's he's still wrestling with it. Like the latest thing I wrote this down, it, he believes that allegiance to anything that puts obedience above decent behavior towards an innocent human being is evil. And I think that's, that's yeah. I think that's what he starts writing in his book. I can't remember if he finishes that book or not. Or where he, but I feel like he he is not like come to a conclusion of this is how I justify all these things and make sense of it. He's still wrestling mm-hmm. with it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. He basically, yeah, he comes to that conclusion, and then his wife says, "We need to go to the time tombs," and he's like, "No," and um, he hears the voice again, and he's like, "No, I'm not going to do it." And then his yeah. wife dies, and then he and then he i forget what what conclusion he comes to other than he needs to go to the time tombs yeah i I think he kind of finds himself with no other recourse right like right i don't i didn't get the sense that he was like giving in and saying i'm going to go and kill her there because the dream is telling me to it just feels mm -hmm. like he's going there because what else can i possibly do maybe yeah once we get into the presence of this thing something will reveal itself i read it as him deciding to go like you said not to uh like give obedience but instead to like have that to be able to challenge whatever that force is there then and there you know Mm. um so not yeah as more so i i viewed it more as like a uh like an active confrontational decision in that regard um but uh, i feel like uh coming from like religious backgrounds um i don't know what, what are your guys' thoughts on the uh uh the rationale behind this because i feel like obedience is is definitely one that is uh like the purpose of the abraham story is to show that like obedience over everything else right i think that's something a lot of people do believe about it. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think about the, what are there other things you think that story could be uh, used to promote? And yeah, where do you guys land with it? I I like that. Um, Saul kind of exemplifies this choice, you know, to his family over, you know, maybe his, his God. I, coming like my uh, I think many religions are are kind of they teach um you know put god first in your mm-hmm. life and then you know after that is your family and you know other good things and i've always struggled with that because in my mind i feel like i always put my family first and and that's my number one and i feel like you know, almost that's the way that you can worship is by, you know, loving your family. That's that, yeah, that, that is, you know, one of my core philosophies. And so it's very difficult, you know, to read stories like this where, you know, God asks like in the Bible where God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son, you know, that he's tried like he's wanted for so long and tried for so long to have. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it's almost like, I mean, it is an impossible question to ask of a parent, which is, I think, you know, why it's the part of the story. Yeah. And I, and obviously like, that's kind of the conclusion uh, Saul comes to. And I think that uh, those who disagree would like their thought process would be, uh, like this God would know what is best for you so much that it is in yours and your family's best interest to have, you know, the best life you could to obey, you know, Mm -hmm. to have that obedience there. So 
I guess the the counter to that would be it may seem paradoxical, but really it's part of that. Uh, maybe it's like part of uh, like humility and a lack of pride as well, rather than just a focus on obedience. Um, but you no. Know. Anyways, when I I don't know if you guys are like yeah. had more thoughts on that. I don't want to like put anyone on the spot, but it's almost <laughs> like you're approaching this and having to split your mind into two pieces, like your quote or something. And like one half is believing yeah. that like my devotion to God will be good because God will never, you know, ultimately like following God is always going to lead me to a good path. Right. And then the other mm -hmm. half is like, I am committing to killing my child and I, it's it's like part of you doesn't believe that it would actually happen but at the same time you're saying i don't know if i'm really explaining myself very well but it, it, it to me it just feels like even approaching this and making a decision you are you're accepting that there's a paradox to the whole thing I, I'm probably yeah. just confusing everyone. It's, no, it's no, I like, like it. I like it. Yeah. It's kind of like playing like a game of like, would you rather, you know, to, you know, your friend with your friends and giving them like two impossible choices. And you're like, yeah, I can answer this now because I don't actually have to make this decision. Yeah. But right. if you, if like this was posed to me in any like actual scenario in real life, I wouldn't be able to, you know, answer this. Yeah. Or, also, I mean, I yeah, would yeah. go with the obvious answer of, no, I'm not going to sacrifice my child because no God, no loving God would ask me to do that. But it's, it's also hard because for Saul, like at some level, his agency was taken away when this happened, right? Like his, you know, that his daughter is going to, die right so like what choice does he have at this point so that's that's what's tricky about the whole situation is like he kind of mm. kicked against the rocks for so long that he like at some point the decision was made for him and that's why he just like finds himself there without ever like yeah making the like affirmative choice to do it you know so yeah i think there's also like a message there too of like if god has a plan for you or if the strike has a plan for you or whatever i don't know like then that's what's gonna happen, you know? I think that's a good uh, kind of segue with these few minutes we have left. Uh, like, what? who do you think was actually communicating with him, like asking him to offer up Rachel as a sacrifice? You, it sounded like my you thought it was the strike. strike. That's strike. what my theory I mean, yeah. sure seems like it, this like evil. I mean, it seems like Sauron himself is coming in a vision to tell him to do this. Um, I, I I don't remember the the actual answer to this question, so I I'm answering honestly, and I mean the time tombs are doing some funny things, so I, maybe it's himself, you know, from the future somehow, somehow oh, yeah. trying That's to motivate him. Yeah, we definitely have seen a lot of time manipulation in the in the story so far. So yeah, yeah, that's hard. Yeah, yeah, uh, but I I really do like this, Jake. This is probably my favorite one. I think the first one might have been first one's better, really good too, just because it it also had the sociological like yeah uh, or I don't know like the study of people right yeah um and so I enjoyed that aspect of it, but in terms of yeah just like I'll find myself thinking about the situation like how de like how hard that would be you know and yeah. like the the mental games that you would play because it's like. At times, you know, like my daughter is almost seven. Like, and how nice would it be to like go back and capture like the moment when she was like first mm -hmm. walking again. And it's like at some level, that's what he's getting. But like, it's so perverse. You know what I mean? Like, it's so yeah. messed up. So the thing, the thing I think about is like it'd be so hard all those years going backwards, where every day he has to like pretend like, you know, it's whatever day it was the last she remembered. And that it almost feel like a relief once you got to the point where she couldn't remember that but at that point you have such little time left you know like mm -hmm. yeah yeah um 
Yeah, really, I feel like this one was really, uh, like, really impactful. I feel like it gets everyone right in like the the feels and in the mind, like the heart and the mind are stimulated. Yeah, in this in this tale. Um, like when I was saying it would be a good Black Mirror type episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, what did you guys think about? I mean, in between the tales, we saw that the town was destroyed, and then they're in that wind wagon crossing the sea of grass. I think that's just like a cool world building thing. These like razor razor blade pieces of grass that go off endlessly with like giant serpents in them. Um, and then the, yeah. the world tree is like burning in the sky, the big, right? Yeah, the big, the cool strip that they came in has <clears throat> been destroyed up there. Yeah, That stuff's interesting, but it almost seems unimportant because what you really care about is them getting to the time tombs. And yeah, that's like you know that they're going to gonna make it to the time tunes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they have a bunch of plot armor right now. Well, are they? I mean, okay, okay, shut up, Jake. All right. I mean, all all they know is no one ever returns from the pilgrimage, right? They don't know. Hmm. That's true. But I feel like they've got to they've got to make it there, otherwise if, a lot of I things would just yeah, yeah. I was gonna say if I don't see the Shrike do some calling of this of these people once they get there, then I might be a little <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> Call, calling so of, who, of martin <laughs> i guess uh la last question i have uh they talked about in the beginning that getting to the like making the pilgrimage you get like a boon to request of the shrike if you believe in the the church of pains um oh, right, theology right, right. Yeah. um and then potentially only one wish can be fulfilled whose wish do you wish to be fulfilled at this moment I mean, obviously, we all are going to say Saul because if you Saul, don't, yeah, you don't, we have a we heart. Love Saul, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, the, the priest response. is also the priest is the priest. also in a super bad situation. Yeah, yeah. Feel bad, but feel bad for a, that guy. You know, he's an adult. <laughs> so is Rachel. He's an addict. So is Rachel. <laughs> Rachel is what sixty years old at this point. Yeah, give her. Yeah. What about what about Kassad? He I don't think he has a wish of the Shrike, but he he's going to kill the Shrike, right? That's true. What if what if he well, kills the Shrike before really... wishes are granted? Yeah, I mean, killing the Shrike would probably be helpful, so I could be What's, done for that. No that's... wishes though after that. But is that your boon? What if you like his boon Just is to wish. kill it? Yeah, yeah. That's like a genie, like a paradox. Yeah. I, I can't like believe you guys didn't pick the Martin. Night Watcher here. You don't want to see the the Hyperion stuff fulfilled. No, dude. Don't want to. No. Uh, All right. <laughs> Martin can die. Martin can just yeah. burn. Yeah. Do not like that guy. Yeah. Take a <laughs> long walk off a short cliff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> nice. I guess a short cliff would just be like a curve or something. I said that wrong. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, what's the difference between a short and long cliff? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, our next episode can be the remainder of the book. Yeah. Like, yeah. At, at that point, right? Yeah. Awesome. All I don't have questions to wait for answered. Steven to finish. Secrets revealed. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a lot of secrets. We may have to wait till book two. But book hopefully two answers... This whole time is just Jake plugging book two. Yeah, right. Book two answers 95% of your questions, I'd say. Yeah. Hopefully book two, a satisfactory book, two... book one, at least some things. And and book two can just be one episode. Don't worry, audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you guys later. Yeah. See you. Bye.